Today we're going to talk about um, Ephesians, and we've been in the book of Ephesians. Um, this is week five, and so today I'm going to talk to you about the courage to walk in Christ-like giving, or living, as you're giving. <laughs> so the first three chapters of Ephesians are really about the gospel story. And now, last week, Pastor Mandy had the puzzle up here and doing all the cool stuff. I don't have a puzzle. I'm not that creative. Um, I literally tried to eat one of the pieces because I thought it was a new way of doing communion last week. So, um, But the last three chapters are really focused on our story and how our ability to live a gospel-centered life which will take courage, especially when no one else is looking. So to better understand our ability to live this gospel-centered life, I think it's super important to understand a couple of things and answer a couple of key questions. First off, what does it mean to be a Christian? And I'm sure most people are going, Pastor Mike, duh, I'm here, it's a Sunday, I know what it means to be a Christian. But we live in a world where identity is being attacked every day, where what being a Christian is, is being attacked every day, whether it's via social media, whether it's via the internet, but it's kind of been twisted a little, and maybe the traditional definition of what being a Christian is means something a little different to some people. So I looked it up, and it actually means living in a way that is guided by Jesus's values, which include showing love, mercy, and grace to others, even to those who are different than us, or, and this is going to be a tough one, to people who don't even necessarily like us. In short, being a Christian means following the example set by Jesus, striving to live a life that reflects his teachings. Amen? So what is unique about being a Christian and what makes Christianity unique compared to other religions? And I think this is important as well, again, because I think our identity as Christians is being attacked. In Christianity, salvation is not based on our own merit or efforts. We can't earn our way into God's favor through our good deeds. Gary can tell you this, no matter how many weeks he serves at the food bank, no matter how many trucks he picks up, he can't earn God's favor through his good deeds. Church attendance, you can have perfect church attendance every Sunday, like George. Just kidding. Not really. Um, but that doesn't give you God's, it doesn't buy God's favor. You can't have obedience or a set of rules or laws. That's not going to get you in good with God. Instead, Christianity teaches that we are only saved through faith in Jesus alone, who died for our sins and rose again. Christianity is the only religion in which God comes to us rather than the other way around. We don't have to spend our lives trying to reach God. Instead, he came down to earth in the form of Jesus to meet with us. Jesus is the figure in Christianity and is fully human and fully God. He is the way to God and the representation of God the Father. His death and resurrection is critical to the Christian faith. If he didn't come down, guess what? There wouldn't be Christians. So I think it's important as we're talking about in Ephesians and what Paul's about to tell us that it's, it's important to understand what does being a Christian mean and why are we different than other religions? Because again, every day... Uh, you're going to be told something different. I, um, it's funny, before we gave ourselves to Christ, we had, um, I'm going to out us a little, we were in the uh, village and we saw one of those coexist um, bumper stickers and we're like, oh, that's really cool. 
that's awesome. And then one day I was convicted and realized it's kind of like a lie. Like we can coexist in the sense of us being all one people, but the only way is through Jesus. So why is it so important then to live a gospel-centered life? And why now? Why is now so important? Well, the world today, as um, Pastor Josh and Pastor Michael talked about, isn't very different than it was in Ephesus, Ephesus. Um, it's very similar. And um, Paul, Ed, this is your cue. Ed was like, he looked at the scriptures. He's like, oh my gosh, do you really want all of these scriptures? Because that's a lot. And I said, no, Ed, just the blue one. So um, Ephesians 15 Paul warns us, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because these days are evil. And that's the most important part. If you get nothing else out of this verse, just get that we live, just as Paul was saying, in a very evil age. Therefore, do not be foolish but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. It was really interesting, that fourth song, I don't know if you caught it, but you could hear, like there was just a different, voice. It was just the Holy Spirit. It's like people were singing in the Spirit in that fourth song. It was amazing. Always giving thanks to God, the Father, for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In those verses, Paul gives us some really good advice for living our lives. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he shared with it to the believers at Ephesus. See how Paul starts the text. He is almost warning us how to live in these evil days. If you go back to the 515, be very careful then how you live. He's warning us how should we live. As a Christian, someone who has put their faith and trust in the redemptive work of Christ through his death and on the cross and his resurrection, our behavior should reflect and resemble Christ. Amen? We should be gracious and merciful to others. That's behaving like Christ. Forgiving, loving, and praying for our enemies. And that's a tough one. I even prayed for my um, Dallas Cowboy fans on Thanksgiving, even though they beat my team. I prayed for them. Welcoming and serving the marginalized, the least among us, is being like Jesus. Caring for the sick, needy, underprivileged, widowed, orphaned, poor, abused, and vulnerable. Those who are, in la- who are last mirrors and reflects the Son of Man. Striving for justice resembles Jesus. Remember, it's not simply our good works that make someone a Christian. Being a follower and disciple of Jesus extends beyond our outward behavior. It includes the condition of our heart. Paul also wants us to wake up and live wisely. And if you could pull up Ephesians 5, 8... For you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful to even mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, 
rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Paul is telling us to be careful to not be spiritually asleep in this season, but rather be spiritually awake. In Revelation, Jesus would say the very same thing, uh, this time to the church of Sardis. And Sardis was a church that was in Asia Minor. It was one of the seven churches that they described, he described in Revelation. And its city and the hill that it stood on seemed really strong from the outside. It had a good name and reputation. It was probably respected as a once thriving church in the region. However, on the inside, the light of the church had been snuffed out in only a way that Jesus could call out. Revelation 3 1, Jesus tells Paul, um, John, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the light in the sight of my God. During our spiritual journey, we may miss out on God's plan for us because we're spiritually sleeping. Not a literal sleep, but we're spiritually asleep. Right before Judas betrayed Jesus, Jesus was in the garden with Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, um, which, you know, like whenever I read scripture now, because I'm a big Chosen fan, I see Big James and John uh, when you hear the sons of Zebedee. So it's kind of cool sometimes um, how the Chosen will kind of, you know, connect those things so like you can actually see a face. So I'm like envisioning them all in the garden. Um, and Jesus is telling them, hey, okay, I need you to stand watch. I'm going to go pray. Jesus was having a rough go of it. This is the night before he's about to get crucified. And he's like, okay, I need you to just stay awake for an hour. Stay awake for an hour while I go pray and and talk to to my father. Jesus goes, comes back. They're asleep. And Jesus is like, are you kidding me? Really? Come on. You couldn't even be awake for an hour for me. So he's like, okay, let's try this again. He goes off, comes back, asleep again. We too, like the disciples, can miss out on those key things, those, those things that Jesus is trying to tell us if we're asleep. We need to be awake and alert and paying attention to what Jesus is saying and how he's moving. The scripture that I just described is Matthew 26, 37 through 44. And here's what Jesus actually says. Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, Father, if if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And this is when he returns to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch for me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. This is Jesus telling us that when our flesh is weak, that's when that spiritual sleepiness is going to sneak in. He went away a second time and prayed, My Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping again because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more, praying the third time for the same thing, saying the same thing. I, I don't know about you, but I, did not, I wouldn't want to be one of the three that fell asleep twice on Jesus. So, Paul has laid out the reason for needing to walk in Christ-like living because we live in this evil world. Now we're going to go into the how. And this is kind of what I really love. Um, if you don't know a lot about me, um, I've been a uh, retail district manager for 14 years, so I'm like kind of wired a little different 
than a lot of folks. I'm like, you have type A and then you have me, which is like type AA. So I like, like work lists and like, you know, leaving lists. The only person I won't give a work list to is my wife um, <laughs> because I know better. <laughs> So um, I do not give uh, Kim a work list because that would not end well for me. So she's probably watching and texting my phone right now. Uh, so Paul, again, has laid out this reason. And so there's four key directives in Ephesians 5 that Paul instructs us to live to please God. And these are practical ways. So this is where um, you have these really cool pens um, Pastor Janie ordered these cool pens, and they actually have a little uh, like stylus on the back, so you can use them for your phone and all that cool stuff. So this is where you can kind of jot some stuff down. But Paul's telling us we need to, one, live in order to please God. Live in order to please God. So how should we have a life, or what can we do to have a life that will please God? We need to live a holy life. And that sounds easy, but what does it really mean? It means choose truth instead of lies. Seek peace rather than anger. Be generous rather than envious. Speak life into people and embrace encouragement rather, and this is like a tough one, rather than gossip about others. We should seek opportunities to forgive others as we have been forgiven. And I think that's important. We need to seek those out. Don't wait for them to find you. Find the person that you know that you're supposed to forgive and give that forgiveness. And when given a choice in the world, we need to exercise self-control. Paul lays this all out in Ephesians 5.1 through seven. So if you have your Bibles, open to that, because I think this is uh, pretty important. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself, I'm sorry, and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality. Again, we should exercise self-control. Or any kind of impurity or greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this can, you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. He also tells us, Instead of drunkenness, choose God's Spirit to lead you. Ephesians 5.18 says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. And we covered this again, but I think this is one that just kept coming up um, as I was writing the sermon, and I think that it's important. Um, Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. Even the season that you're in, that you don't know why you're in it, give thanks to him because he's going to show you the reason why he's put you in that season. Paul also says to love one another. And this wasn't in... Uh, Ephesians, but it's uh, still Paul talking in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, and you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. This speaks of unity and team spirit. Pastor Mandy talked a lot about unity last week, and I think that it's super important when you think about 
um, loving each other. It's not that Western material love that Paul's talking about here. It's that true love. It's that, how are you going to love your enemy? How am I going to love my fellow Christian who's a Dallas Cowboy fan, you know, and who, you know, we're, you know, beating, you know, going, you know, I think uh, Rod's a big San Francisco Giant fan, and Patricia Lynn's a Dodger fan. I don't know how that works, but it does. For how many years? Like, forever. I think Rod, Rod said the most uh, wise thing I've ever heard. Um, we were doing an online bingo during COVID, and he said, don't worry, men, the first 50 years are the hardest. It gets so much easier after the first 50 years. So, um, But I think that when you think of that, it's loving one another. The person that you never thought that you could love, God's commanding you to show them love. Live a quiet life. And it's hard because my last name is Noise. I, it's like literally my last name says, don't be quiet. But Paul says, in, again, in 1 Thessalonians 4.11, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business. Amen. Amen, right? That's a tough one. I was like, I was like, Paul, did you really say that? And make work with your hands. You can make work with your hands on uh, December 9th at the Nativity, you know, work, th- work party. Um, but Paul says, work with your hands just as we told you so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. And this is really interesting because this is how I kind of lead my teams at work. Um, You know, I can sometimes get excited. I can sometimes be vocal, but I have found that the way that my teams respond best to me at work are when I may be a little more quiet than, you know, I don't maybe not mind my own business, but I allow them to be kind of co-heirs in their business together. And, you know, I may, you know, I'll work with my hands right next to them. And when I do that, there, something changes. So I think that, you know, that's what kind of Paul's talking about here. It doesn't necessarily mean that when you leave a quiet life, Live a life that people, that when you leave, live that quiet, more humble life, people will be attracted to that, and they'll see what's different in that person. There's um, managers that work for me, and then they work for different district managers, and they just go, something's different about you, and it's because I have Jesus in me. That's the, that's the only thing, is that I'm, I get to give them Jesus. And so I think that's what he's saying when he says, Live a quiet life. So that's number one. Number two, be careful how to manage your time. Ephesians 5, 15 through 16 says, Be very careful then how to live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, again, because the days are evil. The key word there from a time perspective is making the most of every opportunity. Psalm 39.4 says, Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. Since our time on earth is limited, let's make the most of the time that we have left. God already knows the opportunities he's going to place in your life. He has already made those plans. He set up the appointments. He's got the divine appointments ready for you. It's all lined up. Kind of scary to think that, but he already has plans for you. In his plan for you, no one else can do. That's the crazy thing when you like submit yourself to God. You, the plan that he has for your life, Jeremy's plan, no one else is going to be able to do that plan but Jeremy because he was uniquely created in a way to execute that plan. 
the uh, divine appointments that are in front of Jeremy are just for Jeremy. Ephesians 2, going back a little, 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So, what is our part? Well, our part is to make most of every opportunity he puts in front of us. Because, again, like Paul stated in verse 516, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. We have been called to be the salt and light of the earth. Like Noah said earlier, Mark asked, what's your favorite season? And Noah said, salt and pepper. He was like already getting ready. He had it, you know? In some translations, making the most of every opportunity is also written as redeeming the time. And when I look this up, time, the Greek word for time that's used in this is called kairos. And not kairos, our youth group, but kairos is referred to as an appointment Pointed time, a moment in a season when opportunity knocks. So when that opportunity knocks, you have a choice. Are you going to open that door and allow God to work through you and jump on that opportunity? Or are you going to kind of go, mm, I think I'll pass on that one. I'll, I'll let Jeremy do that. I, you know, I, I got something else to do. I'll let Jeremy set up the chairs. I got something else to do. That happened this week. I'm sorry, Jeremy. I, I admit that. Um, there's a great illustration in the Bible where this Kairos moment happens and two groups of people respond in a very different way. And it kind of, it, it shows you how Paul tells you that this, this is how you should have responded and this is how people who probably responded in the wrong way. And what's really neat is it ties totally into our living nativity. So it's when the star came out. The star shines. The wise men see the star. If anyone wants to be a wise man, let us know, because we could always use, you know, extra wise men. You know, Jeremy and I are amazing wise men, but we're always looking for more, right, Jeremy? Only three lines. Jeremy, Jeremy's, you know, promoting. You can come find him later. Um, but that's a Kairos moment. They see the star. And how do they respond in that moment? They go, okay, let's get our stuff. Let's get our gifts. And we're going to go meet the king of the Jews, the one that was promised to us. And they go, in contrast, around that same time, there are priests and teachers in Jerusalem that also experienced that Kairos moment. They knew where the Messiah was going to be born, rough and tough. They knew where he was going to be born. It was prophesied. Yet, in their preoccupation with other things, as well as their indifference, or you could almost say their sleep, they chose differently. They missed that Kairos moment. They missed that opportunity. It went straight by them, and they lost out on the chance to worship the one true king. So I guess you can think of it this way. Who would you rather be in that moment? Would you rather have been one of the wise men that was giving gifts to Jesus and worshiping him, or one of the scholars, one of the priests in Jerusalem that uh, had too much else going on. I think I know who I'd want to be. I know who I'm going to be in about 10 days. So, Number three, do the Lord's will. Ephesians 5.17 says, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. When we talked, I talked earlier about identity and the confusion that the enemy of, the God, of God tries to uh, put into your life. 
I think this is another attack that the enemy does, and he does a really good job of it because um, when I pray for people, uh, sometimes we go, if it's God's will to, for me to not be sick or not, if it's God's will for me to be healed, let it happen. Well, God, God clearly defines what his will is for us in the Bible, but yet we keep getting beat down. We get beat down by the enemy, and the enemy starts to try to twist that will and make us almost believe that God is an angry, mad God, and that we, the things that are happening to us are because it's God's will for us to be in pain or to suffer. So I have uh, seven things. You don't have to write all these down. If you want, you can just ask me, and I'll email them all to you, because uh, I should have probably had like a way bigger bulletin. But um, what is... God's will for our lives. One, it's to be saved. It's God's will for us to be saved. Second Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slacknessness, but is long-suffering to us not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I always think it's interesting when you read the New Testament and you can tell the difference when Peter writes, um, when Paul writes. Um, Paul always likes to drop in some Christ Jesus um, when he's writing. So it's, I just think it's so awesome to hear how everyone writes a little different. So that's number one, to be saved. Number two, to be holy and transformed. And we talked about what it means to be holy earlier, but in Romans 12.1, it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So it's God's will for you to be holy and transformed. I don't think it's his will to binge watch several hours of Netflix. I'm not saying anything bad about Netflix. It's maybe, you know, balance. Um, number three, it's God's will for you to give thanks and to give thanks with a thankful heart. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It's not his will for you to go onto social media and complain about your neighbors or to complain about your friends, or your football team, which maybe I do. It's also God's will for us to do good. 1 Peter 2.15, for it's God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. These are all promises that God has made to us in the Bible. And if you notice, every single time so far, he literally, the Holy Spirit is using the words God's will. But yet, so many times we believe the lies of the enemy and we believe that his will isn't for us to be saved. That the enemy wants you to believe that his will isn't for you to be holy and transformed or to give thanks. The enemy goes, it's okay to vent a little or to bicker or to complain in that situation. But God said, no, I want you to give thanks into that situation. Number five, in God wants us to live in truth, not lies. John 8, 32 says, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Number six is to live in peace. It's God's will for us to live in peace. Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I had a neighbor where we used to live that they were a little rambunctious, a little 
rough around the edges. And um, it was tough. It, um, it was a tough season. He, uh, they were loud. They did bad things. They said bad words. Um, no, it wasn't Mark. <laughs> um, and um, it really took a lot out of me during that season. And I, I think once I truly understood that it was God's will for me to live in peace and to just carry that peace, then God actually moved us to a different house. It was like, okay, now you're thankful for the house I gave you. You're, ha- you're thankful for the people that you're around. You're thankful for these things. And when we, I finally said, okay, I'm going to live in peace. No matter what they do, I'm going to live in peace. I would put my hand on the wall every day and pray peace over our house because we shared a wall. They were like a apartment condos. And, you know, I would just pray peace. And then eventually God was like, okay, it's time for you to leave. And I still see those folks. I drive by and I see those folks and I go, I just thank God. I like, it was so awesome that God's will came through in that situation. And then to experience forgiveness and find opportunities to forgive. Luke 6.37 says, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. That's God's will for our life. And God wants you to live life to the fullest and even delight in doing His will. He wants your focus to be on what he wants for you. So walking in the will of God is kind of like a baby learning to walk. I remember when my daughters Emily and Lauren would first learn how to walk, they would sometimes um, hurt themselves. They would sometimes fall, and then Kim and I would give them a supporting little hand every time that they would fall and help them up. It's the same with God. We have to take the initiative, like my daughters did, to be and walk in that will of God. And as we proceed, God will help lead us to his specific will. And when we fall, he's going to have his hand there picking us back up, going like, it's okay, get back up. That's number three, which is, do the Lord's will. Number four, be filled by the Spirit. This is the last one. Ephesians 5.18, and again, we covered this a couple times. Uh, Do not get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. It's interesting that Paul contrasts with these words. Don't get drunk on wine. So I started thinking about it. Why do people drink sometimes? Um, At times, they're not coping well with the realities of life. Sometimes people use alcohol to bring an outside stimulation into their lives to overcome loneliness, rejection, failure. And I said sometimes because not always. Um, Failure or depression. They may resort to alcohol, drugs, lust, gambling, sin, to bring temporary relief or temporary pleasure. But in the end, end it does more damage as it, than it does help. I drive into Los Angeles a lot, a couple times a week, for probably the last maybe eight years. And um, this one I've seen literally in... I've seen transform in front of my eyes. Um, You can believe whatever you want about the legalization of pot. When that happened, a spirit changed in the city of Los Angeles. People, more and more people went to outside ways to fill that hole. I saw more homeless popping up, and I'm sure there's other reasons um, it's not really, I don't, it's not really a political thing, but I can just say my own experience as I would drive, I drive into Los Angeles two to three times a week. And when that happened, you started seeing people 
started to pick a counterfeit spirit. They chose a counterfeit spirit. They chose the lie of the enemy. Take this, and this will get rid of your pain. This will get rid of your problems. Versus God and the Spirit, which will fill those problems. These artificial stimulants lead to excess addiction and reckless living. They are ultimately destructive, which is the goal of the enemy of God, which is to destroy your life. Paul says, don't stimulate your life with things like that. There is much better alternative. Be filled with the Spirit. But sometimes we are tempted by these artificial stimulants because during these times when we're tempted, we're not filled with the Spirit. So we may not be getting those basic internal needs in our relationship with God filled. So that's why we sometimes maybe seek out other ways to be filled. What we really need is to be filled with the Spirit. We need God to saturate us with His love and His peace. And how do you know that you're filled with His Spirit? Well, the early church in Acts 2, it was pretty easy because you saw fire going, you saw tongues of fire, and people were speaking all kinds of different tongues and languages. It was pretty easy to see then. But some ways that you're going to see it now, or that I've experienced it, um, I will sing, which you probably don't want to hear me sing. I was like, thank God. When at that fourth song, and I was like, ooh, I wonder whose voice that is. I was like, Aaron better have this mic muted. (laughs) That's not going to be good. Um, But being thankful. My heart is positioned in a different way when I'm filled with the Spirit. I feel the ability to elevate others in a different way when I'm filled with the Spirit. Paul describes it in Ephesians 5.19 and I've said this before, but I think there's just so much in Ephesians 5. I was like, when uh, Pastor Michael said, you get to ta- teach on that, I was like, I was a little bummed at first because like, oh my gosh, I wanted to show Iron Man during Ephesians 6, armor of God, I have the scene, I was ready to go, and then I was like, oh, I get to do 5, but then I, 5 is just so rich. Um, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ-like giving, living requires a Holy Spirit. God is a provider of that spiritual knowledge and power. Sometimes the Spirit is spectacular. Sometimes you're going to get hit and you can't stop laughing. Sometimes you'll be weeping. I Think back to a day that my wife called me at a conference and she was uh, sent me a selfie of her and she was like all crying for like an hour. And I was like, oh, that's great, babe. Uh, like, do you need me to come pick you up? You know, she's like, no. And then she sends me another picture. She's laid out on the floor. I was like, I think I better go pick her up. Uh, like some random strangers picking my wife up. But um, sometimes it's very spectacular like that because he needs to get your attention because you're in that season, you're in that moment where maybe you've bought into that counterfeit spirit and he needs to wake you up in a way that's just going to be like, wow, okay, bam. There's other times, though, where it's going to be maybe a little more subtle. You can be in the car. Just be hanging out. You can be at work. You can be praying in the morning. You could be out in your garden and it's just God's going to speak to you and the Spirit's going to descend on you in a different way depending on the season that you're in. To live a life that is Spirit-filled, we must learn to stop, listen, and then follow Him. So Paul gives us these four directives to help guide our story. Remember, we talked about the beginning of Ephesians. The first three is the gospel story. The last three are our story. Be careful as to how you live. That's the how. How we should manage our time 
remembering that Kairos moment. Do you want to be a wise man or do you want to be a Pharisee? To me, that's more like the when. Be careful to do God's will. That's like the why. And then to be filled with the Spirit, that's like the who. In following these four directions, our story is going to align more and more with his plan and his story for our life. His story for your life is so much better than the story that you have. You may go, man, my story is so good, God, let me tell you. And he's laughing, going like, you are so funny. Like, I have the ultimate story. I have the plan. So remember, what does it mean to be a Christian? We talked about this earlier. How do you show love, mercy, and grace to others, even those who are different from us or maybe don't even like you? Are you Christ-like in your actions? If we were to put your social media accounts up on the screen, would they be Christ-like? Would you, do you choose anger over forgiveness? Our salvation is not based on our own merit or efforts. No matter how many good deeds we do, how many times we set up chairs at church, or our obedience to rules, we are only saved through the faith in Jesus. So let me ask you this, church. Based on your actions and how you feel you lead your life. If your neighbors were asked, what God do you serve? What would their answer be? Just something to think about. Your neighbors may not know anything about your spiritual walk. They know a lot about your actions. When I would pray on that wall every day for years, I knew their actions. I smelt their actions. I saw their actions. I experienced their actions. They knew what God I served by my actions. In spite of the way that I felt about them, when he needed $35 for a new set of brake pads, he came to me and I gave him the money. I think actually Kim gave him the money because I probably would have said, no, he's not getting any of our money. But literally, we gave him the money to fix his brakes, even though knowing what God he served. So is this something to think about? Colossians 4, 5 through 6 says, Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. It is never too late for your neighbors to see the God that you serve. We serve a God of second chances. And it's through this that we get the ability to change, and to show our neighbors the God that we truly serve. So we can become even more like Jesus when we take his body and blood. However, Paul does warn us in his letter to the Corinthians about the condition of our heart when we commune to the Lord. So I felt it was important to share this today. Paul says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 30, so as I'm saying this, you can get out your communion cup. I had dropped my communion cup earlier. I had it ready to go, and then I dropped it, and I was like, oh my gosh, I lost Jesus. I felt like Mary and Joseph when he was at the temple when he was like 12 years old. I was like, oh my gosh, I lost Jesus. Luckily, I think it was a gluten-free one. So, for Paul says, for I received... From the Lord, what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, 
This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, did everyone get communion? In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant for my, in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So when whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many of you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. So as you drink this today, I just pray that God, if you're in that sleepy moment with your walk with God, that this drink, that his blood will restore that vigor, that strength, that belief that you don't have to be asleep anymore. I want to pray you off with a blessing. So um, Paul does say in Ephesians 3.16, I pray that out of his glorious riches, that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Having the courage to be Christ-like will impact every part of your life. So this week, I just say, have that courage to just be Christ-like and again, follow those four things and watch God's story transform your life. Thank you and have a great week.